Thank you. Um, so I, I just want to start by saying how glad I am to present some of my work over the last 10 years on sea snakes. Um, oh, I need this little thing. Um, and today I'm going to start by very briefly talking about the evolutionary history of sea snakes, mostly focusing then on the um, diversity of sea snakes in Australia and endemism, and particularly focusing on why West Australia is so important for um, for sea snake biodiversity, both on an Australian scale and on a global scale. Um, then I'm going to talk a bit more about their, their species-specific distributions, the fact that they're incredibly patchy and that there's genetic and direct evidence of very restricted dispersal that might account for these patchy distributions, and more importantly, what that means for conservation, particularly in the light of evidence of population declines on some West Australian reefs, which I'm going to talk about at the end. So um, if you don't understand this tree, it doesn't matter. This is a uh, molecular dating phylogeny. All you really need to know from it is that it's been dated with fossil calibrations. Oh, press the wrong button. And the true sea snakes are up here. I might just go back. The true sea snakes are up here. This is all other advanced snakes, terrestrial. And basically, they're a very young derived radiation. And when you look at that more closely, the most recent common ancestor of the true, true sea snakes probably lived about five million years ago, which is young from, on an evolutionary perspective. Um, true sea snakes have two distinct evolutionary lineages, a much larger lineage that's mostly interreefal, mostly occurs in Southeast Asia. Um, its most recent common ancestor probably evolved around three million years ago. And then... Oops, then the other main group, um, which is mostly reef associated, and which I'm going to be talking, um, focusing on, oh, come back, <coughs> focusing on today. The most recent common ancestor of that probably lived about two million years ago. It's a much smaller group. There's only two genera, nine species, and all of them occur in Australia, and a lot of them are endemic to Australia. So um, focusing on this group, this little tree here um, is a mitochondrial phylogeny, basically describes the relationships among species and all the branches in this phylogeny have really strong support, so it's a well-resolved phylogeny. Um, for the moment I'm just going to show the distribution of different species in this group. So there's two really widespread species, they occur all around Australia, also in New Caledonia and possibly also in New Guinea. There's the two basal species in the group, also occur around Australia and also in Southeast Asia. And then, as I said, there's five species endemic to Australia and they're endemic to West Australia. Um, focusing on the olive sea snake, so the olive sea snake is the most common abundant sea snake. It's the one where people go scuba diving on the Yungala on the Great Barrier Reef. This is the sea snake that you see. Um, its distribution was previously thought to occur from Shark Bay to the Southern Great Barrier Reef in Australia. That's the most commonly described distribution. Um, but when you look at the phylogeny and you get samples from Broome and you do the genetic data, the samples from Broome actually form a sister species to the olive sea snake. And then when you look more closely at the morphology, it turns out that this snake is actually quite different from the true olive sea snake. When you go to the historical records in the Russian Journal of Marine Biology, there was someone who described off broom this other species, Apisurus tenuus. And up until... And when people go scuba diving off broom, they say they see the olive sea snake. But actually, it's this other species that's previously only been known from four snakes sitting in jars in Formalin somewhere in Russia. Now, when you go to Shark Bay um, and you get samples from there and you put them into the phylogeny, oh, go back, it turns out that this is actually a really different species. People call it the olive sea snake, but it's actually a species that was also described from Shark Bay but commonly not recognised as a species. And it's not even the sister species to the olive sea snake. So the point is that along West Australian coast where people talk about olive sea snakes, basically what you're seeing are really distinct species that are evolutionarily quite distinct from the olive sea snake that occurs around the rest of Australia. 
And there are also olive sea snakes apparently described from other places like Coral Bay along the coast. I've never been able to get samples from them, but hopefully one day I will. Um, and it begs the question of what species are actually occurring there. So focusing a bit more on the olive sea snake, just on interspecific, um, intraspecific genetic diversity. This is a haplotype network. Basically, a haplotype is just a, a unique genetic signature that um, individuals have, and it shows the relationship amongst individuals. And all you really need to get out of this is that the Timor sea reefs, which are in purple here, have much higher genetic diversity than the Gulf of Carpentaria or the Great Barrier Reef. And the pop there's really strong population genetic structure, so very little gene flow on this large regional scale. And this is also true for nuclear microsatellites. So now looking at a different species. Um, oh, I won't worry about that. Um, looking at different species, the turtle-headed sea snake, which is um, also the basal species in this group, its uh, known distribution up until recently was basically just on Timor Sea Reefs, the Southern Great Barrier Reef, and New Caledonia. When you look at a, a tree of haplotypes, basically you get the same pattern as for the olive sea snake. So basically, highest genetic diversity on Timor Sea Reefs, independent dependent of sample sizes. Excuse me, I have to drink water. And lower genetic diversity um, on the Southern Great Barrier Reef and in New Caledonia. The same strong genetic structure and microsatellites show the same pattern. So what I'm trying to emphasise here is how much greater the genetic diversity is on Western Australia reefs compared to the rest of Australia. Then in the last few years, I got samples from what is, looks like the turtle-headed sea snake from um, Broome. And the first thing you notice is that the Broome haplotype is really divergent from all the rest of the Timor Sea Reefs and New Caledonia samples. So there's more than 2% sequence divergence between the Broome sample and the rest of the Australian samples. And 2% sequence divergence is kind of like a gold standard. It's not a diagnostic feature, but it's a gold standard that might distinguish two different species. Um, when you look at the snake, it looks like the turtle-headed sea snake. I haven't actually seen it in the flesh. I only got a tissue sample from this poor little beach, um, beast that washed up on Cable Beach. Um, and similarly, from Shark Bay, where there's samples at the West Australian Museum, it also is really genetically divergent from all the other Australian samples. So the emphasis here is the really strong um, genetic divergence along the West Australian coast, which I think is completely unappreciated until now. Um, so now I'm just going to focus in on a little study that's relevant to the West Australian story, but it's actually taken place in New Caledonia, which I've done in collaboration with Rick Shine from the University of Sydney. So basically, he um, takes annual holidays in New Caledonia. Sometimes he goes there twice a year. He goes snorkeling on this beach outside his hotel and on this other beach just across in the other bay. And he's caught and pit tagged over 700 snakes in these two study sites um, in these boxes. And he goes back annually and recaptures them. And um, he's had 1,500 recaptures and no, 1,500 captures, 713 recaptures. And out of those 713 recaptures, only on two occasions were the snakes in different bays than where they were originally tagged. Um, so in all the other times, snakes have, have strong phylopetry to bays. And this is just like just over a kilometre apart. And there is continuous reef connecting those two study sites. And this is, he's got ma males and females and it's true in summer and winter. So it's seasonal and uh, across both sexes, this strong site fidelity. So I've done some genetic work on the snakes um, that he's been capturing. Um, and I screen microsatellites for 70 snakes from each bay. Um, there is significant differences in allele frequencies at microsatellites between these two so-called populations. And when you put them in a Bayesian clustering analysis, you get um, 
the multi-locus genotypes from one bay are significantly different from the other bay. And so basically snakes within each of these study sites are more closely related to each other than they are between study sites. So the phylopatry is actually uh, resulting in a genetic um, signature of restricted dispersal. Um, so this restricted dispersal, uh, the larger scale studies that I showed you previously also show restricted dispersal, but I've never had samples on this such a fine spatial scale. And this obviously leads uh, to potential implications if a local population goes extinct and this restricted dispersal is true at other parts of these snakes' ranges. Is this popula are populations likely to be replenished by dispersal over ecological time frames? And I should point out that in case you don't know, sea snake, true sea snakes all give birth to live young. They don't have larval dispersal. So yeah, basically snakes swim to their new location. So now I'm just going to talk oh, a tiny bit about Ashmore Reef to finish, um, to finish up. So Ashmore Reef um, was pre or has been described as the sea snake capital of the world. And the reasons for this is that over the years there's been records of 17 different species of sea snakes from Ashmore Reef and the surrounding waters. Um, the, the, most, uh, the earliest historical record was from 1926, which is just one of those uh, natural history records where the author says there's more than 100 snakes from at least six species were caught with relative ease. Um, in 1972, there was a dedicated survey for, for 14 days at Ashmore Reef, and they caught 367 snakes from 11 species in that 14 days, and apparently saw many more which they didn't capture. And between 1994 and 1998, Mick Guinea um, estimated that there was a standing stock of 40,000 snakes at any one time at Ashmore Reef. So in 2002 I did my first trip to Ashmore Reef and I was there for 10 days and I did just dedicated searching and I caught um, 125 snakes from five species and critically two of the three species endemic to Ashmore Reef I didn't find despite intensive, search, intensive searching. Then 2006, Mick Guinea, he's been doing continuous surveys there. He was there for 15 days. He only caught 28 snakes from three species. And then in 2009, Zoe Richards and some collaborators were there doing other surveys but also recording sea snakes. And they caught three or saw three snakes just from one species in four days. In addition to this, there's been a lot of evident or anecdotal information about sea snakes disappearing from Ashmore Reef. So last year I went to Ashmore Reef on the, on the Ashmore Guardian, the Australian Customs Vessel, and did dedicated surveys. So I did um, 50 kilometres of manta towing all around Ashmore Reef, more than 15 hours in the water, as well as... Um, scuba surveys at sites where they were, sea snakes were previously known to be highly abundant and boat surveys across the reef flat. And basically, I, just, I saw 46 or caught 46 snakes from just one species, the olive sea snake, which is the most common and abundant species um, on reefs in Australia. And these snakes were all captured in this one part of Ashmore Reef. So there were no sea snakes anywhere else on Ashmore Reef. So to put this in a context, oh, so the next thing to say is I'm not going to be able to tell you why sea snakes have disappeared from Ashmore Reef. I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I'm going to put it in a broader context of the Timor Sea Reefs, which we saw pictures of, um, which we've seen better pictures of earlier today. And basically, um, so Ashmore Reef is an emergent reef. There's neighbouring reefs, Cartier, Hibernia and Scott. The three um, species endemic to this region, two of them had only, have only ever really been recorded from, Cartier, uh, from Ashmore and Hibernia reefs, and they haven't been seen since 1998, except there's a small caveat to that, which I'll get to in a second. Um, the third species um, also occurs at Scott Reef and Cartier Reef. And I did see that in 2002, and it ha has actually been recorded in 2007 
but there's no documented records of that since then. But I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't been seen then, just because not many people go and survey those reefs for sea snakes. Um, in 2009, all sea snakes were assessed under IUCN uh, criteria, and the Timor Sea snakes, these two are now listed as critically endangered, and this species is listed as endangered, um, and this is also under Australia's EPBC Act. But just to make things interesting, the other day I went to the, I've been in, went, went to the West Australian Museum, and um, last year someone deposited one of these two critically endangered species, Apisurus folius squama, into the uh, West Australian Museum collections. And this particular individual came up in a trawl. It's not clear from the records whether it was a fishing trawl or whether it was a research trawl from somewhere near Barrow Island, where it's never been previously recorded. So I think it just highlights how little we know about what's going on with sea snakes on the West Australian coastline. And whether this is whether it's just a vagrant individual, whether there's a whole a huge population there somewhere, um, I, I don't know. Um, and the other thing to say about this is that so there have been these incredible declines on Ashmore Reef and anecdotal evidence that sea snakes might have declined at Cartier Island, but interestingly, as far as you can tell, based without rigorous surveys, this is less the case from Hibernia and Scott reefs. Um, and What's potentially interesting about that is that Ashmore and Cartier have been marine protected areas since 1980, but Scott and Hibernia haven't. And as Luke pointed out this morning, Scott Reef was really heavily uh, damaged by bleaching in 98, but these reefs and Ashmore apparently far less so. Um, so, and the other, the other uh, final part of this story is that most of these sea snakes have very similar uh, life histories, habitat preferences to the turtle-headed sea snake that I sh was talking about in New Caledonia. So there's um, good... E uh, the possibility exists that they also exhibit this extremely limited dispersal, particularly given the strong population genetic structure that we see <coughs> over larger spatial scales around Australia. So it does beg the, beg the question, what... Oh, sorry what, um, whether Ashmore Reef will be recolonised by sea snakes in any kind of time scale relevant to conservation. Um, so basically, just to sum up, sea snakes are a very young radiation. This group I've been talking about is less than two million years old. Those Australian endemics probably evolved in the last million year in situ on Ashmore Reef. Um, West Australia is very important for sea snake biodiversity. I think we don't appreciate its importance. Um, and there's direct and genetic evidence for restricted dispersal that potentially um, influences the ability for population to recover. And what we don't know is pretty much everything else. Detailed species-specific habitat distributions and abundances, dietary requirements, habitat preferences, the thermal tolerances of adults and juveniles, detailed reproductive ecology, to what extent coral reef degradation affects um, reef-associated species, what kind of protection would actually protect species from, going, um, uh, from declining. For example, we have no historical, detailed historical habitat data from Ashmore Reef to compare current data to, and we don't know why these sea snakes have disappeared from Ashmore Reef. So I just want to thank um, the many, many, many organisations, people who sent me samples over the years and people who funded me and questions.